In the story of Abraham, Abraham is a, um, he's an old man when the story starts. As soon as you start talking about Abraham, start flickering again. <laughs> it's going now, It's see? one of my tricks, man. I'm telling you, dude, yeah. it's never happened before. This is wild. So Abraham is like 70 years old when the story starts, and we don't know anything about him. He's completely nondescript. He's a case of failure to launch. So he has rich parents, and he has everything he needs at hand. So he can live the life of a satiated infant. Uh, he, like, he, like he's in the throes of, of what would you say, materialistic plenty. Mm. Okay, and the voice of God comes to him. now, But it's characterized in a very particular manner. So God comes to Abraham as the call to adventure. And that's a very useful thing to know. So in the Moses story, God comes to Moses as that which attracts his interest and takes him off the beaten path. In the story of Abraham, God comes as the spirit of adventure. And God makes Abraham a deal. It's a very specific deal. And it's the best possible deal. This is the covenant, by the way. This is the covenant. So God tells Abraham, if you leave your zone of comfort, if you remove yourself from your father's tent, if you move away from infantile materialistic satiation and go out into the terrible world, and you do that voluntarily, you have the adventure of your life, this is what will happen. You'll be a blessing to yourself that's genuine. So instead of being racked with self-doubt and being self-conscious and taking yourself apart with guilt and shame, you'll ride the wave of adventure and you'll feel that your life is a blessing. Not only will you feel that, it will be a blessing. That's the first thing that will happen. The second thing will happen is that other people will notice and your name will become renowned and that will be valid. You'll be a blessing to other people in that regard. Your name will be upheld. So you'll stand out among your peers, but in a justifiable manner that's a consequence of your own intrinsic merit. The third thing that'll happen is that you'll have the opportunity to establish something permanent. For Abraham, it's a dynasty, right? He's offered the possibility of being the father of nations. And the fourth thing that happens is you'll do it in a way that's of cardinal benefit to everyone. And so what happens in that story, this is so cool. It's so remarkable. It's the answer to the selfish gene, by the way, as well. So what this story does is it takes the call to adventure, which is the instinct that makes children move out into the world. It's the spirit that you encourage if you're a good father. It lines that up and it says, if you follow that and let it pull you out of your zone of comfort, your life will be a blessing to you. Your reputation will grow. You'll establish something permanent and you'll do that in a way that's good for everyone. Right? So that's a hell of a good deal. And that's... That's the story of Abraham. Okay, so why is that relevant to the psychedelic debate? Because if you're going to move into the zone of the transcendent, you have to take on the requisite responsibility or the process of transcendence turns into something like a descent into unstructured chaos. And that's not an improvement. It's just a movement from tyranny into the desert. That's a good way of thinking about it symbolically. So in what happens in, in the Exodus story because it also details out how this should be structured, is that Moses has a vision of individual responsibility and social organization that's maximally responsibility-based. So Moses tells the Pharaoh to let his people go, but that's not the phrase. The phrase is, God said, tells Moses to say this. He's, let my people go so they may worship me in the desert. And so you move out of the tyranny, that's what happens, let's say, in the throes of a psychedelic experience is that the preconceptions are shattered. Now you're somewhere unstructured. Okay, well, you can't worship what's unstructured. You have to find the proper structuring for your new freedom. The vision that's put forward in the book of Exodus is a vision of multidimensional responsible identity. So you take on responsibility for your own life, you take on responsibility for the life of your wife or your husband. You take on responsibility for your family. You're a model for your community. You serve your state. You do what you can for your nation, and that's all united under your highest upward orientation. And that's ordered freedom. That's ordered freedom. It's not the same as the hedonistic freedom that the people like Nixon and the sort of right-wing conservatives of the 1960s were terrified by, that kind of hedonistic anarchy it's well, not freedom. It